Hi everyone, Chris Potts here. This is the third screencast in our series on conversational implicature. In part one, we reviewed the core concepts and calculated some implicatures, and part two was focused on diagnostics to help us identify implicatures in the wild. For this screencast, we want to address another fundamental issue for implicature theory, and indeed for all of pragmatics. To what extent are these proposals and findings universal, that is, common to people the world over? and maybe even common to any conceivable social agents in the universe. First, we could approach this independently of Grice and just ask, what would we expect in terms of variation around the globe? I imagine we'd feel two opposing pressures there, right? The intuition that people are fundamentally the same the world over, and the intuition that people and cultures are different the world over. Now, if we assume too much that everyone's the same, then we might not do justice to real and important differences. Whereas, if we assume that everyone is different, then we run the risk of essentializing different aspects of cultural variation, and that could lead us to a biased and problematic worldview all on its own. Second, we should scrutinize Grice in particular. Right? Even if pragmatics is universal, Grice's proposal for pragmatics might be wrong in the sense that it's, it's say, too focused on a particular set of social norms that reflect the cultural and social environment that Grice knew best. Relatedly, a lot of people hear in what Grice wrote a particular sort of normative attitude. For example, when he says things like, I'd like to be able to think of the standard type of conversational practice not merely as something that all or most do in fact follow, but as something that is reasonable for us to follow, that we should not abandon. This does sound pretty normative to me. As you can tell from my own presentation, though, I believe Grice was establishing very general social norms, but with the purpose of showing that violating those norms or playing with them has social consequences that we can detect and study. But I grant that Grice can sound awfully prescriptivist, or even like he's trying to police or regulate social interactions of the sort that he prefers. And so all of this might lead us to abandon Grice and pursue a pragmatic theory that's more sensitive to cultural variation somehow. However, I'd like to offer a different view. I'd like to argue that Grice actually achieved a pretty good balance between universality and being sensitive to pragmatic variation, and that the key to seeing this is to make sure to always consider the context as a vital ingredient in all pragmatic reasoning. That should go without saying, but it seems like it's often not properly considered. Context is everything in pragmatics. To engage with these issues in a more concrete way, I'd like to use this famous article by Eleanor Oxkeen entitled The Universality of Conversational Postulates. This article is based on anthropological work that Keenan did on Madagascar and Malagasy society in the 1970s. And she begins the paper with exactly the question we want to address. She writes, In developing such notions, philosophers likely reflect on conversational conduct as it operates in their own society. The qualification is not explicit, however, and principles of conversational procedure are presented as universal in application. In this paper, we examine the validity of this assumption, focusing on the work of Grice, in particular on his notion of conversational maxim and conversational implicature. And from there, Keenan zooms in on the maxim of quantity, and in particular its clause one, be as informative as is required. Later in the paper, she writes, to what extent does the maxim be informative hold for interlocutors in Malagasy society? Despite certain clashes with other maxims, are members generally expected to satisfy the informational needs of co-conversationalists? No. Interlocutors regularly violate this maxim. So that's the central observation, and Keenan provides a lot of evidence for it. The quotation continues, they regularly provide less information than is required by their conversational partner, even though they have access to the necessary information. If A asks B, where is your mother? And B responds, she is either in the house or in the market. B's utterance is not usually taken to imply that B is unable to provide more specific information needed by the hearer. The implicature is not made because the expectation that speakers will satisfy informational needs is not a basic norm. So, a pattern of being underinformative relative to the goals of the conversation. That is indeed flouting or opting out of quantity or experiencing a clash between quantity and some other pressure. Now, Keenan identifies two factors that help us get to the heart of these behaviors, I believe. First, new information is a rare commodity. Information that is not already available to the public is highly sought after. And second, the fear of committing oneself explicitly to a particular claim. 
And then Keenan provides a lot of specific scenarios and patterns to help support the descriptive generalization. Here's a brief summary. First, speakers will give only necessary conditions rather than necessary and sufficient conditions. For example, how do you open the door is met with, if you don't turn the knob, it won't open, rather than by turning the knob. Second, speakers avoid naming specific people, often instead opting for indefinites like someone. Third, speakers frequently use passive-like constructions, as in the paper was completed, even when the active would be more natural, as in I completed the paper. And finally, if some information is widely known or easily obtained, then speakers are more forthcoming. Okay, so we should think about how best to characterize this evidence and what it means for Grice. First, though, let's ask ourselves, can we think of situations in which Americans routinely behave this way? I certainly can. For example, consider the press secretary of the United States. She often conceals information even when reporters demand it. She's opting out of quantity because more powerful societal forces are at play. It's the same in the more mundane setting where a student asks me for the answer to an exam problem. I recognize their need and I'd like to be a pragmatic user of language, but obviously I can't just give away the answers. So quantity is a pressure on me, but not the only pressure and certainly not the one that wins out in every context. I think this is deeply related to the first factor that Keenan identifies too. Remember, new information is a rare commodity. Information that is not already available to the public is highly sought after. Right? I would hope that the answers to the exam are rare commodities. So I suspect what we're seeing is that we all experience the pressures Keenan identifies and we resolve them in similar ways based on similar considerations. It's certainly interesting that this seems to be a fundamental facet of Malagasy society. And it might be that, at least at the time of Keenan's work, this is because it was a pretty isolated and closed society and so new information was a real social commodity. The fear of committing oneself explicitly to a particular claim is also noteworthy, right? For Grice, this would be a quality-quantity interaction. Again, we all feel this. At least I hope you feel it in situations where your claims really matter and where being wrong has grave consequences. So again, it's noteworthy that this pressure is very strong and pervasive in Malagasy society. And we might venture that quality standards are indeed higher there on average than they are in, say, California. But this seems like working within Grice's paradigm rather than finding it to be faulty. Finally, since we're linguists, I can't resist mentioning the linguistic details. Heavy use of passive and avoidance of proper names, these might have their origins partly in the morphology of the language and its conventions for how referential terms are used. So, for example, the world over, we find lots of situations where proper names are avoided due to cultural taboos. Those would be outside of Grice's theory, but definitely interact with that theory. And of course, the use of the passive is one of our prime examples of trying to opt out of quantity, as in mistakes were made. So my takeaway from all this is that Grice's theory is helping us pinpoint areas of cultural variation and even understand how they relate to communication and language. And actually, I believe that's generally where Keenan comes down as well. When she steps back from the evidence presented near the end of the article, she says, Having pursued the operation of one Gricean maxim in one society, we can see that assessing its status is no easy matter. We've seen that, for example, whether a Malagasy conforms to the maxim be informative or not depends on certain societally relevant features of the interactional setting. Grice, among others, has noted the possibility that a maxim may not be adhered to in certain contexts in our society. It may, in fact, be the case that the situational constraints suggested for Malagasy society affect the maxim in Western societies as well. For example, the constraint of significant information applies to both societies. In our society, speakers tend not to satisfy the informational needs of the addressee if doing so bears unpleasant consequences for them. Further, the constraint of speaker-hero relationship appears relevant here. Whether or not one is expected to be informative varies enormously with the social roles of the interlocutors. Many professional roles, lawyers, priests, press agents, for example, demand that the occupiers of these roles be discreet rather than be informative in certain cases. So it sounds like we have something like consensus that Grice's ideas could be useful tools, and perhaps also we have evidence that we'll offer better pragmatic analyses if we do them with the full cultural and linguistic context in mind, being sensitive to observed variation while also honoring the fact that people are people everywhere.